Well, hello, and welcome back to another episode of Crudely Drawn Conclusions with David Chapman and Michael Leonard. It's David and Mike. It's us. We're here. We appreciate you listening. Now, I was actually... I got a little explaining to do about this episode. We did, at some point in this episode, talk about the top five action movies of all time. And when I... David asked me about it, and when I... I lifted them off. I just kind of went off the top of my head, and I was fine with it at that point. And then uh, I was actually editing the episode, and uh, my my kid ran in and said, Daddy, Daddy, the dogs are in the chicken yard. Yeah, because I live out in the middle of nowhere, and I have chickens and dogs and goats and pigs and all kinds of things like that, and one lone cat, de-balled and declawed. But that's beside the point. So I had to run down or walk down. I didn't run. I walked down there and I had to mend the fence. And as I was mending the fence, listening to a little bit of 90s rock, as I am wont to do, I began to think about my choices and with regret. So when you get to that point in this podcast and you you listen to the top five action movies of all time, just bear in mind I was going visceral, gut, off the top of my head. Gut and off the top of your head don't really go together, but I did it anyway. The, The only one I really regret is Black Hawk Down. I put Black Hawk Down of all movies, in the top five action movies of all time. Leaving out Braveheart. Leaving out Last of the Mohicans. Leaving out Gladiator. All of these great action movies. And that's not even mining the well. That's not even mining going back to the 70s and the 80s. And Oh my God. Well, you know, I was put on the spot. Well, to be fair, I I did have plenty of forewarning. We uh, teased it in a podcast before. And then I completely forgot all about it because I mend fence and take trash and off and have to do yard work and, you know, employment and whatever. And I forgot all about it. And then David brought it up and Black Hawk Down escaped my lips. But don't worry. Don't don't fret. Black Hawk Down's a fine movie if you like it. A lot of explosions and we, we kill all the bad guys, sort of. And then you have to kind of figure out who the bad guys are. Hey, whoa, whoa, easy there, big fella. But we did talk about other things in this. We talked about a... A ship in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico during a storm. And how a young lad on board was posting social media. And everyone was scared and crying. And I, it, it made me want to kind of throw up in my mouth thinking of grown men standing crying. And, you know, I'm no super tough guy or anything like that. But it, having worked in an industry like that for 20 years and then to have it kind of just summed up or put in a way that people would think that these guys are out there non-professional, just crying in the hallway under the the grim, under the encroaching or in, uh, approaching Hurricane Ida. Oh, they just kind of set with me wrong. But anyway, I don't want to digress too far. And another thing, I've, I've been trying to branch out, listen to other podcasts. I've been trying to listen to some of the smaller ones instead of just the Joe Rogans and the Tim Dillons and the Time Sucks, you know, because I, we, kind of produce a small one as well so I was listening to some and some of them are just they're so good yep I will not mention any names whatsoever but I listened to one of them and the the intro was five minutes of please buy my shit buy my merchandise buy my hats buy my shirts buy my mugs buy my pens go to patreon and support us and then uh you know after that was over the, the show actually started and it was complete horse shit but you know who am I to judge right just a guy in a bedroom recording an intro. But if you do want to go give David Chapman five bucks, go to Cup of Joe and look up Cruelly Drawn Conclusions and cut us a fat, sweet check for five bucks. And I've rambled on long enough. Let's get to the show. And with that, a little theme music and young David Chapman. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to another Crudely Drawn Conclusions. My name's David. How you doing, Mike? Ah, fantastic this morning, man. Doing fantastic. I love to hear that. I guess I'll just jump right in, man. Um, with, with just another covid story i guess but um you know tourism has been affected all over the world indonesia with such a lack of tourism 
uh, has has seen uh, quite a rise in um, monkey attacks. Have you seen this? I have actually. I have seen this monkey raiding. Yeah, you, you know those monkeys over there. Uh, the the local monkeys were were really used to quite a bit of tourism, quite a bit of uh, you know um, tourists walking around feeding feeding the monkeys and. Uh, when tourism got shut down over there, uh, monkeys still need to eat, huh? Yeah, you'd think so. Apparently so, anyway. Yeah. So I guess, what have they been doing? They've been just going and raiding people's homes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, as far as I understand it, uh, essentially, like you said, the tourism industry has uh, slacked off quite a bit due to some uh, pandemic action. So the monkeys are still there, and they've lived side by side with these friendly Indonesian um villagers or whatever you want to call them i'm not going i'm not trying to say that they're backwoods or anything like that but they've lived alongside of them but now they're hungry and hunger uh, has a way of motivating uh, all things with no fruits and vegetables and peanuts and things like that the uh, the i believe the macaques were entering the uh, villagers homes and taking what they wanted through force through might right makes uh, might makes right uh, so now from what i read the villagers have decided as a solution to this, rather than just fight back or kill them or to control the population of macaques that are in the area, they have actually started basically bringing them a tithe, bringing them a, a donation and an offering and genuflecting before them and placing it so that, the, so that the fucking macaques won't enter their homes and steal their shit and, you know, go forth from there. I love, I love this story. It really just shows you what happens when, when some, you know, you remove something like tourism just the the kind of consequences it it has you're seeing it there i mean those the the animals they were so used to it it kind of reminds me a little bit of like penguins or not penguins but uh what are pigeons in like central park and in new york and stuff like that and you know they can get pretty aggressive i don't know if they've seen anything like that and i don't think tourism's been totally shut down in new york i mean there's still somebody out there feeding those uh those pigeons and stuff like that but no this is this really is a great story and it <laughs> Um, I wonder how long it actually took them to start getting that aggressive. It couldn't have been that long, but uh, it really looks like it's turned into enough of a situation where they've they had to have some sort of town meetings and come up with with solutions and just start dumping fruits and nuts and stuff like that just so they'd be left alone by these monkeys. So really, we can kind of say this about all kinds of groups of animals like this. Those Indonesians were living alongside those those monkeys, and they thought they had one arrangement. They thought that they were coexisting, and they thought everything was nice and sweet and kind, and, you know, cute little monkeys, and everything got along okay. But those monkeys had a different idea. They thought, that's our food source, and our food source is not producing right now. So that whole time, the Indonesian, the people, had this idea of what was actually happening, where the monkeys had a completely different idea of what was happening. All they had were these tourists, and they had these these villages themselves who would drop food or give food, and then they stopped. Well, the monkeys never thought that this was a, a sweet arrangement. They never thought that this was a gentle, kind thing. That was where they get their fucking food. So when the, the food stopped, the food doesn't stop, motherfucker. We run this shit show. And that's what happens with pigeons and all these other wild animals around the world. We have this idea in our mind that they share the same values or their brain works in the same way that ours does, but it doesn't. We're a food source for them, and if you don't give the food, they'll take the food, and they'll fuck you up for it. Now, pigeons are... If you get your ass kicked by a bunch of pigeons, it'd be a little freaky, but you know, you could handle a pigeon. But these macaques are one-on-one, -on -one, just as strong as any Ind Indonesian, and they have really big teeth. So the, the, the true nature of the, the real world is kind of being illustrated right now. When uh, humans constantly do this, they look at a, a cute dolphin, they look at a, a whale, and they give them some kind of uh, human characteristics... When in fact they're not anything like that. They live a, a robust life. They live a life of complete physical activity and complete motion. Whereas most of our life is just sitting around or riding around or living in leisure with our weak bodies. These things are wild. They are strong. And they don't have our morality. Some of them are very intelligent. And usually when you have intelligence and you don't have a moral code of any kind, that's a terrible recipe for behavior as we see it. Whereas it's just a beautiful way for them to survive because they've been surviving that way up until this point and they will continue to survive because now they have a group of slaves who bring them offerings. Oh, I love this story. You think it has anything to do with uh, how 
you know, when we grow up, there's so many cartoons with, oh, this little friendly tiger or, you know, this, this whale with a personality. And, you know, I mean, do you, I think, I think if you were to encounter like a tiger or a, uh, coyote or something like if you were out on a walk i mean your your instincts should perk up i don't i don't think anybody would just walk up to it and start petting it thinking it's just this friendly thing but yeah it's kind of funny how we (laughs) yeah that's true (laughs) it is funny how we 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 do that where we give them these friendly little personalities and even like here in the city we're so used to going let's just go to the zoo and you know there's there's these lions in there and yeah i mean you see how big they are but I mean, you're just right there. You're separated by a little bit of glass, and everything's okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's sweet. Look at that. Look at that lion. And actually, I saw a video the other day, and I, I laughed for quite some time as I as I love the social medias. There was a young lady on the beach, and she was a beautiful young lady in a bikini. Which okay, you got me. I'm gonna, I'm definitely going to be watching this. Now she's doing a handstand, and she goes upside down. And this is in um, I believe Miami. So there's fucking iguanas everywhere because they're you know, not endemic. They've uh, basically taken over the entire area and they they have no natural predators there. So they're just all over the fucking place. So about a four foot long iguana comes trotting up to her and she places her, she's upside down doing this great pose. And you know, her, her body's lean and lithe and glistening in the sun. And she puts her, her hand out for a photo op with this iguana and then it bites her fucking finger. And she, she screams in agony and pain. And she's, it bit me. It yeah yeah it bit you. It's a it's an animal and it has teeth and those teeth are very sharp and it, it <laughs> you put your finger out there and uh, she was so shocked and so just why would it do that? Because it's it's a wild animal and they live a hard scrabble existence and they don't have a, a a whole lot of hobbies. So it's either eating or fucking or sleeping and you put your finger out there and it eh, so why not? I'll taste it and see if I like if I want to eat this thing. And that's what happened. And as far as your question of you think maybe that the the cartoons and stuff have um, made us think of animals in a certain way, I think it's a kind of a two pronged thing. We think of or some of us think of animals in a certain way because of that, but we also made those cartoons because we thought of that in the same way. We always try to understand the world, so when we look at a an animal, we put ourselves onto that animal and how they um, are processing the world. So that made the cartoons, and the cartoons just reinforced it. So it's a kind of a reinforcing circle there. I was talking to a few people about a week ago. Uh, a friend of mine, he's he, he's into hunting and stuff like that. And one of the one of the places he hunts is a a lease where they have uh, uh, like wild hogs and stuff. And it's oh, Lord. one of those places where you know they're kind of a known as a, a nuisance and stuff. And I mean, it's appreciated by everyone there to just like you know, execute yeah, hogs. Them. So we started talking about the, we started talking about the, you know, there's places you can go for a hefty sum. I, I don't know how much, but you can ride in a chopper and mm-hmm. shoot wild hogs with, uh, I don't know if it's AKs or, you know, <laughs> you know some sort of, sure. some sort of high powered rifle. And you basically just leave them there. You don't go and pick yeah. them up and eat them You're and disgusting. stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the people that joined into this conversation isn't a hunter, um, and is definitely an animal lover, oh. and just really didn't like this. And I, I, I almost don't want to talk about this because last time we talked about uh, <laughs> animals and veganism and stuff like that, I, I, had, you know, the purge. We had a lot of people, you know, commenting, but the veganism one we we did as well. But anyway, I guess my question is because we started talking, and let's say you didn't have these people hunting these hogs let's say you didn't even i mean the choppers that's kind of a it's wild i guess but what do you think would happen you know like if you like with what you see in indonesia there's no tourists there what if there's no one hunting these these hogs i mean do they just take over do they just start busting into people's houses and you know, <laughs> messing up everything they have well that would probably take quite some quite some time because it is a, a large area but I've lived in the areas with hogs all of my life. And just for this example, if you don't um, control them, they will definitely com- continue to uh, reproduce, and they reproduce very fast. People talk about rabbits fucking all the time. Uh, hogs are re- probably making at least two litters a year of 10, 12 apiece. So you do the math on that. Now, eventually, as all things are, it would be a self-correcting um, problem because if you know they just kept fucking and fucking and making more and more, then eventually they'd take over the entire 
the entire United States of America, and then they would all die from disease and lack of food. But that's uh, that's probably not ideal. But that would take what a couple hundred years or or longer. I'm just kind of spitballing there. But in the meantime, like if you had property, and if you have property, and you don't control these uh, these nuisance creatures, as we like to call them, they will tear your land up. Have you ever seen land that's been rooted by a group of uh, hogs? Have you ever seen that? I don't, no, I don't think I have. Okay, so I'm just imagining like one other thing you sent me today was a an HOA thing, and I don't want to dwell on that. It's just, but we were talked about HOA things before. You know, it's a very pristine. Um, lawns and very, very particular codes that people have to live by in these neighborhoods. Now imagine your entire lawn rooted down and ripped up about a foot down because that's what hogs do. So people in HOAs who perhaps are animal lovers live in these very strict societies, these very strict neighborhoods. Now, if you live out in the country and you don't kill these hogs, they will completely destroy your entire yard because they can do that. They can do an acre in a night. They'll rip up the entire thing and it'll be just be turned over earth because that's what they do. That's what hogs do, and the sign is very easy to see. So people like to meddle in affairs, and the whole idea, you know, we did create this problem because we kind of re- released them many years ago, but it wasn't us. It was our ancestors that released them. So, you know, within six months of a, a domesticated hog being released into the, the wilderness, it'll actually revert back to the kind of a feral nature because they're survivors, and they're very good at it. So they will, if you don't control them, if you don't kill them, they will take over the uh, the land around you. And there's no solution other than to kill them because you can't reason with hogs just like you can't reason with macaques because might makes right in the animal kingdom. It's definitely interesting. I, I love this story in, in, in Indonesia. And, uh, yeah, hopefully tourism picks back up and we can uh, they can go back to what they're used to. Or maybe not. Otherwise, I guess they'll just – or yeah, or not. And I guess the, the locals will just have to keep uh, banding together and putting out the uh, – you know, massive amount of fruits and nuts, well, they so they, these monkeys will leave them alone. Or maybe they could kill them. Maybe they could fight back. Maybe they could actually see that this is not an arrangement that's any good for you. It's not advantageous for the, the people. It's only advantageous for the macaques. Now, the macaques bring in some tourism, but the people will come to, for the tourism anyway because it's fucking Bali. So what is the... Other than we just want to be a, a caretaker, we are, we're a caretaker species, and we want to think that we have dominion over these macaques, when in fact the macaques have dominion over us which is pretty obvious right now. Okay. Uh, so just shifting gears a little bit, um, kind of, I guess, staying, um, you know, continuing to piss off our our, our good vegan friends. Uh, did you see the story about the uh, competitive eating competition we had? In, so it was, it was a Buffalo Wing Eating Championship. Sure. Don't know where this was exactly. It's America. But, uh, sure. So you know who... J- Joey Chestnut is. I mean, he's he's the biggest star. I think he's been dominating the uh, <laughs> hot dog eating contest for years now. Yeah. Uh, I think close to ten years ago, he beat the the Japanese guy who had been dominating. Oh yeah. And he just hadn't let go. He's just been dominating. So anyway, he got beat yesterday. No way. Uh, so t- we're recording on the sixth, and uh, he got beat yesterday, which was a Sunday, and um, by a, a young man named Miko Miki Sudo. Mm. Um, Where's this gentleman from? Who ate 200, 246 wings in 12 minutes while Joey Chestnut ate 244 <laughs> wings. Damn good accomplishment. I, I love that story for many reasons. Okay, I don't know how many billions of chickens are slaughtered per year, but uh, each one of those guys probably killed 500 chickens <laughs> yesterday. 500 chickens for each one of them because the yeah. wings didn't come from the from the um, the same chicken, right? It's just like chicken wings cut off. So they're, if they're all flats, I guess. I hope there's no drums in that shit because that's disgusting. I hope they're all flats. So if you think about that, 246 and 243, I don't want to do the exact math here. My brain's not wired for that this early in the morning. But uh, that's a lot of goddamn chickens that had to die yesterday for a, a couple of guys to prove who could eat the fastest. But, I, you know, I'm fine with it because I, I watched that spider outside um, eat all those, those bugs that go in his web, and he doesn't seem to really give a shit one way or the other. And I'm the kind of the same way when it comes yeah. to food sources. Yeah, and let, let me make a quick apology. So M- Miki Sudo uh, is actually a female. That's a female. I thought you saw, um, I saw the the photo, and I was like, I wasn't going to question you because yeah. I don't question gender. But no, she, exactly. So she uh, this is this must be her thing. I mean, she's she's kind of been hanging around, you know. So um, she's she's done really well. It looks like she actually won the Nathan's hot dog eating contest in 2020. 
Ooh. Uh, so she's just neck and neck with this Joey Chestnut fellow. She's also competed in a pie eating championship, a meat pie, a cake, chili eating, uh, turkey eating, a gumbo. I mean, she's she's there and, and she's t- at, she's top three in all these. So she's yeah. really holding her she's own. She's putting the points so, on the board. So congrats to her. Yeah. Congrats to this lady. Me, what we just determined that she was a lady, but uh. Like we said, we don't we don't care about gender here on the crudely drawn conclusion. So, and I, I remember watching this stuff. Like I said before, back in uh, many years ago, there was this young or middle aged uh, Japanese lady who was real thin, but she was one of the top <clears throat> top competitive eaters as well. And uh, I, I like the fact that you said that Chestnut is probably still number one. But is this kind of like uh, you know he's kind of he's at the he reached his peak and now he's on the way down and this other. Uh, this other lady, this other woman, is basically, if she's putting up these kind of numbers, if she won the, the hot dog eating contest just uh, this last year, and then she's, she just beat him heads up one-on-one with this wing eating competition, I, I see good things for this lady in the, the world of professional eating as people starve. 748,000 people died last year um, from starvation, just like outright starvation. I do love the fact that uh, we're just like, fuck it. Eat 500 chickens. <laughs> we'll throw the rest away. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's she's doing well. So she's, um, let me see, she was born in New York, got it in her, uh, she has a Japanese father. So that's that's where the name, um, I, I was wondering if she was Japanese as well. So, yeah, I mean, she's, she's kicking major ass, and who knows, maybe she's, um, you know, looking to take over. And this kind of, you know, there, there's a lot of people who say, I mean, we, we talked about that weightlifter, the transgender uh, mm. female who was competing in the the Olympics, who actually didn't place, didn't do very well. And this yeah, might just yeah. be another sign. I mean, maybe, maybe women, we shouldn't look at them as kind of uh, inferior when it comes to some, you know, competitions. Because, <clears throat> I mean, this uh, Miki Sudo is really holding her own. I mean, she's... And now I will I will say some of the competitions she has been in, they've they've broken them up into from a a, a woman's division to a no. you know the, they kind How of split them that? up. Like I guess like in 2015 she got first place in the Nathan's hot dog eating contest, but in the women's division. Well, so I guess they, maybe they they split them up, but but in 2020 it looks like she uh, you know she, she I guess she competed with everybody else so. Well, look, I've watched a lot of ladies eat. And from what I can tell, a lady or a female can eat just as well as any man out there. And I've lived in the South and in Louisiana. And I can tell you from experience, from seeing what's out there, that there's no difference whatsoever between a a woman's ability to eat large amounts of food and a man's ability to eat large amounts of food. So on this issue, on this sport, I can definitely say that you should put men versus women no matter what. Because I've seen a lot of bitches at the buffets, the, the Chinese buffets, and the uh, the Golden Corrals with heaping mounds of food ability. And, you know, the, the, the ability is the same. It's just who wants it more. And I'm just, uh, I'm just glad we, uh, we finally, we're going to be able to see who's, who's better at this. Exactly. Well, let, just before we move on to a different subject, if, uh, if you had to throw your hat in the, in the ring com- and compete in some sort of uh, competitive food, eating competition what food would it be i mean i know you're a big peanut butter fan just from uh, the yeah. years of working with you mm-hmm. uh would it just be jars and jars of peanut butter or something I, else i actually can't imagine sitting down and trying to force myself to eat anything i um despite my larger frame i uh, i'm not a gigantic eater you know i have i, I just i would not excel in that uh, it just kind of makes me uh, sick and i want to it repulses me uh, to think of like gorging yourself, so like I guess peanut butter, but peanut butter. I mean, you get two, three scoops in. What are you going to do after that? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I would try with just maybe just uh, hamburgers or something, something you know, pedestrian. I'm nothing wild and crazy. I'm not a big food guy. I just eat and so that I can yeah. not die. That's basically what I go to. Yeah, and, and there's there's definitely strategy there because I think some would think you know just don't eat for a couple days. You'll be starving. You'll be I'll, ravenous. I'll do that. No, ex- exactly. I mean, I think there's some, 
some strategy as far as stretching the old stomach out, you know, making sure that it's, there's some room there. I mean, who knows that the, the tricks and, and uh, different tips that they might have for, for an amateur. I don't want to get gross here, but I guess but, you got to go to, and you got to think about, you know, just digestion as well. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to go this deep in the weeds with it. I think we need to kill this right now because I'm going to go down a dark hole. Yeah. We can't come. No, back. that's fine. Um, exactly. So a, uh, I guess along the same lines, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, kind of women competing in men stuff. Should there, you know, should they be able to or not? Um, in the entertainment community, in the in the the movie community, I guess, which you know a lot better than I do, um, you know, there's always a little bit. So if there is a um, you know a role for a Hispanic person and it's played by a white person that maybe they get them to look a little Hispanic and maybe give them an <laughs> accent that that can be frowned upon by, you know, the Hispanic community and so on. Um, and there's also a little bit of that that's happened before with, um, with straight people playing gay people in a Recently. movie. And so I guess this is, so I, it, it appears that this is going on again, hasn't, hasn't become a, just a, you know, a huge, huge story, but it's looking like it's starting a little bit. Um, the the very well known Benedict Cumberbatch, who I do know, I don't know everything he's been in, but I know he's a great actor. Um, I guess uh, there's an, a, a movie coming out, Power of the Dog, where I guess he's going to be playing a uh, a homosexual person. And uh, anyway, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that on. Well, I, I you know, straight people playing gay people, white oh. people playing black people, and so on. Well, I mean, okay, there's a few differences there. Okay, so like a gay person, as far as I know, can be any color, can be any ethnicity, can be any race. So it, it's you know, if you wanted to say that an actor is a pretender, an actor pretends to do things. So if you you would say that an an actor pretends to be a superhero, an actor pretends to be a um, a gangster, he can pretend to do a lot of things. So he, you know, ostensibly he could pretend to be a gay person. That seems to be the whole job. So there, I don't see where any controversy would come in there, uh, where a straight actor could play, a, if they wanted to, could play a, a gay person because there's no physical differences there. Now, of course, there is a kind of a big difference between, um, say, uh, let's go Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen playing um, in a slave is set in 1863 in uh, the southern U.S. Now that might raise some eyebrows. Uh, because he physically doesn't fit the bill. There's obviously a physical difference there. And painting him up in some kind of uh, blackface, probably not the most, um, probably not the best thing to do, especially in these days and times. But I, you know, that kind of brings up a logical question. If I'm, and I'm kind of just kind of going down this rabbit hole here, I haven't really thought a whole lot about it up until this point, so I'm probably going to say some stuff that's going to get me in trouble. But if, if Charlie Sheen, one of the formative and greatest actors of our time, that's I don't know if that's true because everything's open to interpretation. But if Charlie Sheen was the best person for the role as a slave in 1861, on a people would say, well, how could he be? Because he doesn't fit the bill physically. That's true. Uh, but what if he was the best actor? He could really emote. If you in, so you kind of go down a blackface um, role with this. And don't worry, I'm going to edit all this shit out anyway, David. Don't worry. <laughs> So you go down this uh, this road with this, and you say, who is best for the part? It has to be, in some instances, you got to look at them physically right off the bat when it comes to certain things. You're not going to have Benedict Cumberbatch playing a bodybuilder. He can't physically resemble what he's supposed to be. But with the, the whole gay thing or the, the political stance or th- something like that, it doesn't really matter. And it only matters in 2021. And I think we, we have to think about uh, this whole world is crumbling around us, and I think it has been crumbling around us for quite some time. But I guess it's just more evident these days in that we're concerned about, and who's concerned about it, really? Are a lot of gay people really mad? Because I know gay people, and I don't think anybody would be mad about Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch playing a gay person. What do you think? That's a great question. Who is mad? And I don't know. I, I haven't, you know, I saw this the story this morning. Um... The, the only thing I would add to what you were saying, and I mentioned it last week, 
you know, trying to make my way through these Rocky movies. I'm a little <laughs> late to the game. Yeah. Okay. But I finished Rocky 2. Mm-hmm. So I've seen Rocky 1 and 2, and I'm about halfway through Rocky 3. You know, when you talk about, you know, people playing, you know, a gay person or another race or whatever, um, I think you, you see it a little bit with these guys ask, being asked to box. And I think if you if you interviewed or you talked to, to a, a Vander Holyfield, a Mike Tyson or somebody, and you, you said, what do you think about this boxing we're seeing here? Rocky versus uh, Mr. T or whatever. They'd be like, they, maybe they would like it. Maybe they'd say, you know what, it's just a movie. I, I'm not going to break it down too much. But I've done that. I mean, I, I wasn't like an NFL football player or anything, but I played football my whole life. And some movies that have very poor football execution on it mm-hmm. make me want to turn it off. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I that's the only way I can relate to this at all. And um, <laughs> I like where this is headed. But yeah, no, the, <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, who would be mad? I think that's a great question. And if they are mad, how mad are they? I, I guess I'm not familiar with the, the Charlie Sheen role, you know, but I think it's kind of like you, what you talked about last week with. You know, these movies are trying to make money. And if they have Charlie Sheen on it versus maybe somebody who's not as well known, that's pro- that's the math they're probably doing. Uh, versus like, hey, we, yeah. we have somebody who fits the part, who is a great actor. We found them. We scouted them out and all that. But maybe they're not really bringing in the, the kind of... Uh, you know, mass appeal because they're just not well known at the time or something like that. Yeah, and I just brought up Charlie Sheen just for just for a goof, just for a laugh because no one's going to cast Charlie Sheen anymore. But um, with Benedict Cumberbatch, and I do have to, I don't think you know this information. Are they actually going to be? Is it going to be gay porn that they're going to be doing? Because I guess that would be different. Like you said, if you're watching football and you can pick it apart, you know. So I think if gay people are in the audience and Benedict Cumberbatch is on screen uh, having sex with a guy, you'd be like, no, that's. That's not how you do it. That's he just he doesn't look motivated. He doesn't look like a professional. So I guess if it did come down to if it was gay porn, and Benedict was not really uh, performing up to par, or didn't make it, you know, didn't have realism behind it. But he's pretending to be gay. He's not actually fucking guys or getting fucked, as far as I know. Yes, uh, let me just read a little bit from this article. Um, so I guess this was uh, the the power of the dog was Jane Campion's. I guess it's the name of a of an author evocative western which premiered to great acclaim in venice and it, it looks like it's going to be one of the the top movies that are oh, in the goddamn. oscar race more gay cowboys so we're, we might have to watch this and review it um yeah, that'll be next week brings, comes out. yeah uh brings great new perspective to its late 1920s backdrop it's an ad- adaptation of a thomas savage novel novel uh and he's playing a ruthless montana cattle rancher named Phil, who projects a crude macho presence presence even as he develops unexpected chemistry with Peter... Oh, with, uh, what is this, Smith McPhee? The son of... So blah, blah, blah. He's a rancher who is gay, I guess. Well, this is a yeah, homophobic I'm, I'm, Maybe fucking a movie. true story. I don't know. It's a homophobic movie. This that sounds is... a lot like... What's yeah. the other um, Western Mountain. with the... Uh... There you go. <laughs> okay, it came out in 2008, directed by Ang Lee. Uh, it was a box office sensation. Did that win any Oscars? Oh, no. uh, Yeah. Uh, yes, it did, um, and it was. I think it made eighty-five million domestic, maybe more than that. Maybe it's one hundred eighty-five million. That's a little foggy on that one. The, I think what we need to think here is the whole description was he was a, he was a brutal rancher, but then he was also gay. That's so fucking homophobic to me because you saying gay people can't be tough fucking assholes. The whole Spartans used to fuck each other. <laughs> that was one of their big things. The whole Greek army was just banging each other left and right and taking over the fucking known world. Alexander the Great. There's been gay people throughout history or people who just like banging dudes throughout history who are still killers and still are, are terrible people or good people. They just happen to bang a different thing than somebody else. So we always, that's what we do in modern society. We always assign some kind of feminine or not even feminine, but we assign some kind of a, a meek and mild quality to someone who's gay when in fact it's just who they like to fuck. It doesn't mean anything about what their actual character is like. And also, I've watched Brokeback Mountain. I've seen it. Do I have to see it again? I don't have to, of course. But it's kind of funny that 13 years later, one of the most acclaimed roles coming up is a gay cowboy. It's like, I've, I've seen it. I've done that. Very, yeah, that's, that is very interesting. And, you know, that was my first thought. That it feels like played out, like it's happened before. Do we need to do this again? But 
I don't know. I haven't read that book. Maybe it's a great story. Well, maybe uh, just from from knowing a little bit about it, it seems like it's going right down that that same lane. So, well, maybe to be like the Avengers. You know, we have like five Avengers movies in the whole MCU cinematic universe. Why can't we just have an entire universe of gay cowboys and it just be sequel after sequel and there's like different exploits? You know, I I think that's a that's a gold mine at least for Oscars. Maybe not for box office success, but anytime you put a uh, the words gay and cowboy in a movie. It, Midnight Cowboy, 1969, with uh, John Voight, Oscar contender. Uh, Brokeback Mountain, Oscar winner. And then um, then this one's definitely going to be in the, the contention as well. So it's like, why don't you just do this every year? And we could have a, a string of Oscars that no one could ever... Just gay no cowboys, right? Yeah, nothing but gay cowboys. Yeah, and do you know... I mean, do you know any gay actors who could have played this role? Just kind of curious. I I, I'm not as plugged in like as you are. Well, I'm not... <laughs> I don't know if I'm like plugged in. Um, I'm sure there there are uh, to the gay, gay actor actors. Scene. I'm, I'm trying to think of some gay actors at the moment. Uh, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's why they went with Benedict Cumberbatch. Lance Cumberbatch Bass, because you know he was who? Lance Bass. Lance Bass. I'm pretty sure he's a he's not really an actor. He's been in a couple movies, but uh, I wouldn't. I don't know if he's a lead role candidate. There's got to be Ian McKellen, Sir Ian McKellen. He could definitely pull this off, although he is about 45 years too old. But he's like the first gay actor that came to mind, and he's a fantastic actor. He could definitely do it. Yeah, there's, there's, I'm sure there are some gay actors, and that's that's homework for next episode. I'm going to think of all the list of gay actors who could probably do it at least as good as Benedict Cumberbatch. Exactly. Well, um, well speaking of homework, yes. uh, during, our last, uh, during our last one, we talked a little bit about so you being kind of a a big movie buff and all that stuff and you said you were going to get back to us on your top 5 action movies did you look into that at all i looked into it for about 6 minutes and i thought about it and you said i i think it's better to just come up with it the first movies that come to mind because maybe that is what's actually better now you can you can reason it away and you can really think about the really good action movies out there. And then sometimes you have to think, what is an action movie? Because an action movie could be part drama or horror or any other genre you want to put it into. But just viscerally, I decided to just come up with it kind of in five minutes and the ones that stuck out in my head. Okay. Uh, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. I guess you really could break them down. Okay, so top five. And like I said, I was... Um, I was going back and forth because people like to really put a lot of information or a lot of uh, thought into these top fives, and they you, you pick the classics, right, when you go for a top five action movie. When I, what I went off on this list, though, is just the ones that first came to mind, first hit me in my head when I thought about it. So I, I, I'm going to put them in order, but they may it may change. But number five, number five, and critics, if any critic is listening to this, and I don't know why they would be, but they will hate me for this because this, this movie is actually kind of hated as a, uh, it's got a 50% or 53% or so Rotten Tomatoes score, but Black Hawk Down. Now, people people will hear that and, and think I'm insane and immediately discount me as any kind of critic or any kind of person who knows anything about movies, but I don't care because when you watch that movie, it's so well done, it's so slick and polished, and it actually, it makes you hate the villain. And they, the villain, unfortunately, and this one is a bunch of Somalians. So that was one of the big things that, happened later after it came out. It was like, we're, you're just painting this entire country as a group of evil people. Eh, well, maybe. Uh, but it worked. It worked very well. And that's what a movie's supposed to do. It transported you to this time, and you felt a, uh, a, lot, of, um, a lot of anger and rage when the things were happening to the protagonist. And you really got behind them, or at least I did. So I, I really appreciated Black Hawk Down, number five on my list. Would you consider that better than Saving Private Ryan? Uh, no, <laughs> not at all. Not but at all. But just more action packed, right? No, because Saving Private Ryan would probably be number four on my list. Oh, yeah. Oh, dang. Man, what okay. a segue that was. It, it shows how we hadn't communicated this. <laughs> That's right. We haven't talked about this at all. We talked about the general conceit of it, the idea of it. But yeah, Saving Private Ryan would probably be number four. And the leap, and all these are pretty much going to be uh, war movies because action to me is, with a few exceptions, mostly, I mean, there's no more action than in war. And you could say that Saving Private Ryan is not really an action movie. It's more of a, a drama. But I, I don't care because it has so much action in it. And all movies have a, a, all different elements of them, you know, with the exception of maybe like torture, porn, horror. 
but all of them have different elements. They have, they have the comedy in them and drama and action, but it's Saving Private Ryan, number four, just the uh, the storm in the beaches scene at the beginning is enough to get it in the top five. There's no more bloody, visceral, you're there in it kind of feel to it. People, I remember when it came out, and this was probably just a marketing technique, that World War II veterans were having to be escorted from the, the cinema because they couldn't handle it because it triggered their post, you know, their PTSD, or back then, even back then they were referring to it as like a more like a shell shock thing because they were from the 40s and that's what they thought of it. But the, the language changed and it became PTSD. So it triggered that in them and they had to be led away. But it's one of, I mean, just throughout, it's over two and a half hours or so and throughout the entire film. And it's, it's heartbreaking and uh, it's much you know more well regarded than Black Hawk Down for sure. But it triggers the same emotions. But it's more layered and more nuanced. It's a much better film than Black Hawk Down. But is it a better action movie? Apparently just a little bit. So number four, Saving Private Ryan. Okay. Okay. So no, I'm, uh, sounds good to me. I, I, what, what you got? Number three. Number three. I'm going to go with Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now, 1979. Um, one of the longest shoots in history. And again, it's another movie that's not really just a straight up action film. And in fact, it's not an action film. It just has tons of action in it. But it's one of the greatest movies ever made, and uh, I would place it in my overall top ten movies, period. So it's number three on my action list, and it, it tells the story. And if you haven't watched Apocalypse Now, I don't know where the fuck you've been for the last 41 years, but it's a, it's one of the best movies ever made. And uh, some of the action sequences in it, as they're going down the uh, the river, trying to go to Colonel Kurtz, and the actual, the uh, the famous Valkyrie scene where the they're storming in helicopters and the, the ride of the Valkyries by... Wagner is playing, and um, it's it's iconic, and it's got some of the most iconic lines in the history of, of film. I love the smell of napalm in the morning by Robert Duvall. Uh, that's one of the most iconic lines. And Charlie, don't surf, because, you know, he's trying to surf. Look, if you haven't watched the movie, none of this is going to make any sense to you. But if you have watched it, you're just reminiscing with me right now. It's For me, number three on the list is Apocalypse Now. Nice. Yeah, I, I watched that a couple years ago, and I did enjoy it. It's a good movie. It is a good movie. Now, this one's a little... I'm going to throw a curveball here, or a slider, maybe a, a sinker. Maybe this is some kind of trash ball that no one can hit back to me. But if you want to just go... How about change-up? Yeah, there you go. It's 82-mile-an-hour change up. After I just threw that uh, Apocalypse Now 99 heater. But um, the change-up here, I'm going to go with John Wick. Either one or two. Because it's essentially just a, a big movie. So John Wick 2. I'm just going to make a do a line in the sand. John Wick 2 is one of the most enjoyable action movies of all time. And I would place it at number two on the list. And have you watched the John Wick films? Have you watched the, the series? I have. Um, and I, I agree. I mean, it, it's very, it's enjoyable. Action-packed. A lot of, <clears throat> a lot of death. Um, but very, it it's, uh, keeps your attention the whole time. Yeah, and it's stylized, right? And this one, they kind of expand the, the mythos, or the mythos, if you like saying it like that and sounding pretentious, of the first film, where the first film just kind of hinted that there was a whole world of assassins and this this uh, culture underneath and this, this structure. And then number two just takes it and beefs it up and makes it even better. And the action sequence... You know, and speaking better. of that, you know, yeah. instead of getting old Keanu to play that, I wonder why they couldn't have found just some sort of you know, a uh, trained killer to play that role, right? That would have been better, I guess. But I don't know if you actually have to kill all of the people because that's, that would there'd be lots of lawsuits and things like that. But you, oh, you have a good point. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what you got, number one? Number one, Full Metal Jacket. And, and again, another movie that people would say is not an action movie. It's more, it's a drama. The first hour, there's not a whole lot of action other than the fact that they beat up Gomer Pyle over and over and you get some choking and people running. But... I don't think there's a when they actually do get in the shit, so to speak, in part two in the hour two, which is not nearly as highly regarded as the first hour. When they actually do get into it, Kubrick or Kubrick, however you want to pronounce it, the, the director um, definitely illustrates the horror of war. And to me, the action is is great. It's well done, but it's it's secondary to the what's actually happening around, and you can people you can see the pain when. When, I don't want to do any spoilers here, but when Cowboy gets shot and the blood comes out, and he's been one of the, the straight 
and narrow guys. He's been one of the guys who's just a straight up nice guy. He does some terrible shit, but he's kind of the everyman character of Full Metal Jacket. When he gets shot and killed, and then later on you find out it was just done by this this young child, this young Vietnamese child, and she killed this great guy, and she had her own motivations and methods for it. Now, there's a, some emotional impact behind it because, like I said, these other ones, it varies. Apocalypse Now and uh, Saving Private Ryan and Full Metal Jacket, they're a different type of action movie than Black Hawk Down and John Wick 2, obviously. There's a lot more depth of character and depth of emotion of what's going on. You don't really give a fuck when John Wick shoots somebody in the head. In fact, you're rooting for him to kill these people. But when the actions happens on the other movies that I've listed here, it's a different response. But if I just go with the first five that come into my head, that's the first five that come into my head. And I guess if a if a movie critic's listening, what do you think? Who who, who would you who would you think that they would say that you've you've left off? Oh, there's tons of them. I mean, people will go back and they'll put <laughs> no, Rocky that's true. in there. They'll put. I mean, Rocky is an action movie, right? Uh, Rambo is an action movie. Not that it's going to be. Look, pr- critics are trying to preserve their own legacy. So when they they pick something, they know it's if lists are always critic, tough too, man. What's that? Lists are tough. I mean, you, it's hard to make a list without leaving something off. It's an ever top quarterbacks movie. of all time. I yeah. mean, if I if I put that list together, you know, there's there's going to be somebody listening like, oh man, you left off Warren Moon or whatever. Yeah, right. it's uh, can't do a list without pissing somebody off. Now that's what we're here for. Hopefully, to entertain and piss off, maybe inform. Exactly, exactly. Well, um, so our time is a little limited. So I wanted to. Speaking of action movies, we'll talk about a little action that recently happened in the Gulf before we before we sign off for the day. So you and I both worked on rigs offshore for, uh, uh, I guess, the longest of my career, any job I've I've ever had, and I, I think you spent half your life out there. There was a hurricane that recently passed through. Was it uh, Ida? Or yes. what? Oh, shoot. <laughs> I should have looked this up. Was it Ida? <laughs> yes, it was Ida. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. And a, uh, a drilling contractor, uh, Noble Drilling, had a rig that was, uh, you know, basically floating out there during the, the hurricane, which rigs do. This is a drill ship. And uh, it started getting some publicity because I guess some people on board were taking pictures and posting them on social media and so on. And it became quite a story. Um, did, did you see that? I did see that. And do you want me to go right off the bat right now, or do you just want to get a little, little more backstory to that? Because this story is – it makes I'll me laugh. I'll let you do both kind of if you'd like. Me. What's that? I'm sorry? I, I said I, I'd, I'd let you do both if you'd like. Well, <laughs> okay. The story is that this, this ship – this. Okay, first of all, drill ship is about 700, 800, 900 feet long. It's a big vessel probably with a beam of about 140 or 150 feet at its widest point. It probably displaces 100,000 tons, and it's probably capable of going 10 or 12 knots. You know, it's a big floating, and the, the, it's got a high VCG. That's a vertical center of gravity because it's got a big derrick in the center of it, okay? And there's a full marine crew on this thing, right? They're mariners. They're merchant mariners that have been licensed by the, the U.S. Coast Guard, probably farmed out to a flag of convenience like Liberia or Marshall Islands because it's cheaper, but ostensibly they were U.S. Coast Guard officers first. And they are highly competent mariners for the most part. Now, when you're drilling a well in the Gulf of Mexico, people want to make money and everything's a day rate. So that, that vessel is probably costing them about a million dollars a day if you factored in all the cost. And it probably goes up and down a little bit of that, but it's about a million a day. So they're trying to drill a well, and this, this hurricane is bearing down on them. And, and I can speak to this because I've been in this very situation many times. The hurricane's bearing down, and they're trying to get the hole drilled, and they're trying to get some casing down there, probably trying to hang off a storm packer, whatever they're trying to do at that particular moment. But they probably waited too long, and they couldn't get out of the way. And then they got hit. And I don't know. I haven't looked it up and see if they were actually still connected. Probably not. They probably disconnected because you can't stay connected. You can't stay on, on location via dynamic positioning because your thrusters would have to fight a gigantic hurricane so they had to have been disconnected in some way now whether they had riser hanging down now riser is a big pipe that's hanging down to the bottom of the ocean or whether they'd completely disconnected and pulled up all the riser and tried to get out of the way and just couldn't make it either way they're being buffeted by storms now bear in mind this is a big vessel and also bear in mind they're professional mariners now the people who are not professional mariners on the drilling vessel are at the actual drill crew they drill holes in the ground. So they're kind of a, they are part of the rig. They are the, the ones that make the money. But without the mariners, they can't actually drill the hole. 
So the people who are posting these stories are saying it's taken on water and it was terrible and it was blowing 150 miles an hour and there were 30-foot seas out there. Yeah, it sucks. Been there. And they said that Noble Drilling and then I believe it was Shell or whatever other company was actually operating the vessel, paying for the services of Noble, didn't get them out of there, didn't get them off there. You know why they didn't get you off there? Because it's a fucking ship and you can't abandon a ship just to float on its merry way, even though that's happened one time before. Anyway, you're not supposed to do that. Because that vessel is capable of handling all kinds of things that are going on as long as you maintain watertight integrity. And even if you don't maintain watertight integrity, it is actually designed to take on lots of water. Because uh, that's how you ballast a ship anyway. And it's designed to be compartmentalized and take on that water, which I'm sure it did take on a lot of water. But they were, they were fine. Apparently nobody died. But the part that got me about this story is this, I would assume, a lower-level guy... I'll sure had access to social media. So he took some pictures. He took some, he, he wrote some lines probably on Facebook or Instagram or one of the other social media sites and said grown men were standing in the hallway with their life jackets on, crying, just sobbing and weeping. And I said to myself that perhaps um, you missed something there because grown men, real grown men, don't stand in the hallway and cry and weep because I've been in that very situation. And yes, some people do cry and weep because they're frightened and they're scared. But when you say that I signed up for this job, it's my job to keep myself alive and no one else is going to do that for me. That's the thing about social media right now. That guy who didn't really know what was going on, he didn't really understand the process because I worked with hundreds of guys like that over the years who didn't really understand what they were standing on. Sent out all that, that information out there and then the CNNs and the MSNBCs put it out there that, that, that they were going down to the bottom and no one would help them. First of all, no one could get to them during a hurricane for sure. There are limits to what we can do as human beings. So at some point, you do have to have a little self-reliance. You do have to take care of things yourself. And more than likely, those people, unless you know they're at the bottom right now, are perfectly fine. And they could have been perfectly fine without all the crying and the whining and the, the bitching that is the modern human male. Does, this, does, does a story like this kind of shine any light on other stories that we read where... So this one... You worked offshore a million years. I worked offshore forever as well. So when we see stuff like that, um, it kind of stands out because we sort we we know how how these situations go. So, but when somebody who doesn't work offshore or who hasn't spent that much time out there, when they see this, they just think, "Oh my gosh!" They start, you know, it's just this huge thing. But maybe for for you or for me, we look at it and we're a little confused because something's just not right and it may be I'm not going to say it makes you question everything you see but you know it kind of does because you're right maybe some uninformed lower level guy um, was putting this out on social media somehow it, it went viral next thing you know CNN and Fox News and stuff they see it and they start um, you know writing about this and more people start seeing it and they get concerned, and next thing you know, the company has to put out a statement. Um, but for, I guess, for people who've who've been out there during hurricanes and stuff like that, or who've been in these situations, they see this, and they, it, it is a little confusing for them, I think. Yeah, it's just like with any industry. And that's when we speak about things. We only have bits and pieces of the information and an outside perspective. Anybody who's on the inside of anything has a much more you know, deep and, and reasoned um, perspective on it. So, yeah, I mean, it, but just when I look at this stuff, I'm like, it's just another sensationalized story and just a product of our modern times. Exactly. Well, I hope that they're all okay. Um, Me too. I know they, they went through some rough times. Uh, there's a little bit of panicking and, and so on, but I hope they're okay. So, but yeah, man, um, we are coming close to the end. We've, yeah. we've covered a lot, and um, I appreciate your time. Anything, any closing, closing thoughts before we, uh, we seal this one up? Well, I've just, I've been a little disjointed. I had some phone calls along the way that I'm going to edit out and no one will ever know. And I actually just had another phone call. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to run on this one. I got to take care of some business. Sounds good, man. We'll talk, we'll talk next time. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Man. All right.
pop for the rap kids. Too rap for the pop kids. Use it loud through my neighborhood. All album cuts, no top hits. Neighbors think it's obnoxious. I'm sorry, Mrs. Anderson, but damn. You gon' have to wait until the drop hits. I forgot to take my vitamins.